Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is uh, Andrew Dalton. I'm the Adams County Historical Society's Executive Director. Oh, I'm here live in Gettysburg, um, but my guest tonight, uh, Valerie Young, is actually live in New York, um, and uh, we're excited to be bringing you this program um, on some really interesting uh, residents of Adams County, uh, a, a few brothers who lived in the New Oxford area and ended up serving um, one one of them, and then uh, they served in different areas, but one ended up serving uh, in France during the Great War. Um, and Valerie has an incredible experience uh, to share with us of, of discovering um, and actually following in the footsteps of, of her own ancestors. Um, so a little bit about the Adams County Historical Society for those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight. Uh, we are uh, the community archives uh, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We have millions of historic items in our collection, records, photographs, documents, um, uh, artifacts, and, and, and uh, you know, images of, of, of all eras all the way back to uh, before the Civil War and way back into uh, the earliest days of settlement here uh, in, in Adams County. Um, so uh, we hope you'll enjoy this program. It's part of our regular Thursday night series. Um, and uh, I hope if you enjoy the program, you'll, you'll also consider clicking uh, the donate button at the bottom of the post tonight. We, we do rely on, on very generous contributions to continue this series, to continue bringing this content to you uh, every week. Uh, we plan to keep this up for as long as we can. Um, and I wanted to thank you again for joining us, uh, the Adams County Historical Society, um, and our, one of our, our members, Valerie Young, who's going to be presenting a, a really incredible story tonight. So without further ado, do. Let me turn it over to, to Valerie. She's going to start uh, her PowerPoint presentation and, and, and share with you a little bit more about the Bauer brothers of New Oxford. Cool. So I hit share screen. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I'm learning. Good. Great. Perfect. There we go. Okay. Thanks so much, Andrew, and welcome everybody. I'm so glad everybody's tuning in to listen to this program. And I will say a special bonsoir à mes amis en France. I think there are some people across the Atlantic that might be watching who speak French. So as Andrew uh, indicated, um, I've written a, an article that's in the journal about this story. And um, I'm really pleased to be presenting this information to you tonight. My maternal grandfather was Chester Allen Bauer and his brother, Charles Edward Bauer, otherwise known as Charlie, was my great uncle. They were born in New Oxford and both served in the Great War. One survived and one did not. Chester and Charlie had an older brother, Willis Peter Bauer, who did not serve in the war because of his age, but who took care of many activities on the home front while his brothers were in service. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a little of my journey of discovery of these three gentlemen and try and bring those stories to life for you as I have been able to do for myself. And as I indicated, the full story is in the, the article published in the journal and you can read about it there. But I thought what I'd do tonight is bring some focus to some parts of the story that are of relevance to Adams County and then share some of the resources that I found that helped me uh, create the story. And I include this photograph of my mother as a little girl with her daddy in the backyard. That's the inscription on the back of the photo because it's the one which most reminds me that I am only on the planet because the man in this photograph survived the Great War. He came home, he created a family, one of which was my mother. And we think this picture was probably taken in the peak of the depression years around 1932, 1933. And as you can see in the, in the parts here, these are the, the topics that I'll be covering tonight, a little bit of my family genealogy, and we'll be talking about the, the discovery of the items from World War I that were in my mother's things. The longest part of the show will be about the Bauer brothers' timelines, all three of them, and their wartime uh, uh, lives. And then at the end, I'll be telling you a little bit about the trips to France that I took to really walk in the footsteps of my grandfather when I was there and finally end with how I came to write and share this story with all of you. Okay, next slide. There we go. So this is my mother's family tree back to her great grandparents. And I am the daughter of Rena May Bauer Young, whose parents were Goldie Marie Bensel, which is the yellow part of the tree on top, and Chester Allen Bauer, the blue part of the tree on the bottom. My mother was born in 1927 in Hanover and grew up in New Oxford. She graduated from New Oxford High School and then went to UPenn Nursing School in Philadelphia. After she graduated in 1948, 
She upsticks and moved west to the small central California coast town of Arroyo Grande, where her older sister was living with her family. And it was there that she met my father, William Moorhead Young, an aeronautical engineering student at USC. They married in 1949, and the rest is really our own family history in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am in the middle of five children born in the 1950s, and some of them might be listening in tonight. My father and his five siblings were all born in the Alameda County, Oakland part of the Bay Area, and that side of our family has a very long history in the state of California. As you can see in the, the, uh, the boxes of, of the family tree, the Bensel family hails mostly from Carroll County, Maryland, but they crossed the Mason-Dixon line frequently and spent time in both Northern Maryland and Southern Central Pennsylvania. The Bensels came to the US in the mid 1700s from the Rhineland Faults area of Germany, which is in the Western central part of the country abutting Eastern France. The early Bensels settled first in Baltimore area, then came up to York County, and then migrated down to Carroll County. Goldie's maternal line, the Selbys, were an original settling family in Maryland from the 1600s and from there to England. Like the Bensels, the Bauer family goes back to arrival in the US in the mid 1700s from the same area in Germany that the Bensels came from settling first in Lancaster County and then moving into the northern part of Adams County in the communities of Huntington, New Chester, and York Springs. My grandmother's maternal line, the Pfizer's, goes back to New Oxford to the early 1800s, to York County before that, and again back to the same area in Germany, uh, arriving here in the mid-1700s as the Bowers and the Bensels. Most of the presentation tonight is on the Bauer family, but I did want to give you some of the Bensel history in the area because I do think it's interesting. These are photos that we found of Goldie's maternal great-grandparents, David and Mary Bensel. David was from Emmitsburg, Maryland, and Mary was from Littlestown here in Adams County. On the left and middle is a photo card, the front and back, produced by the well-known Gettysburg battlefield photographer, William H. Tipton. And although neither of these photographs are dated, we do know that David Bensel died in 1910. So I'm guessing that these were taken around the turn of the century or shortly before. The child in the Tipton photograph is one of their grandchildren and it's quite possibly my grandmother Goldie as she was their first grandchild born in 1898. David Bensel served in the 202nd Pennsylvania Infantry in the Civil War. Then he worked in carpentry and farming and both he and his wife were buried at the Emmitsburg Memorial Cemetery, where many of this Bensel family line are also buried. David Bensel's father, Jacob Bensel, and his grandfather, another David Bensel, were both from York County. His father was David Immel Bensel, born in 1777 and died in 1854. And he lived his entire life at the Bensel homestead in Dover Township. And it's shown in this map from the early 1700s on the left. It's shown as a plantation. It was interesting to me that they called it a plantation back then. David Bensel's family was involved in farming and milling and was well known in the area at the time. They built and owned a distillery, a grist mill, a large homestead, and Bensel's mill covered bridge in the early 1830s. The images on the right are postcards, the top one showing the bridge, which was washed away in a storm in 1972 and not rebuilt. But you can still see the stone footings on either side of Little Conowago Creek there. The house itself has been restored and is currently owned and managed by a real estate investment firm. So Goldie's maternal grandparents are shown in the left here. They are Noah and uh, Ella Selby. And they were both born in Carroll County and were a farming family, as many were back then. These Selbys had 10 children, the oldest of which was Mary Hannah Selby, also known as Molly, who was Goldie's mother. And she is shown in the right folder, a, a photograph with Goldie's father, Calvin Israel Bensel. And they were both born in Carroll County, but spent most of their lives in Adams County. Goldie was the oldest of seven children who grew up on the Bensel family farm on the Newchester Road, which ran between the western end of New Oxford, north to the small community of Newchester. The photo on the left is at their home, probably taken around 1905 or 1906. Goldie is the middle child in the front. She graduated from high school in 1916 
And the photograph on the right is of her class at Devil's Den at the, the uh, battlefield that year. And I'm sure Tim Smith will recognize these rocks. She then attended Cumberland Valley State Normal School in Shippensburg, where she obtained a teaching degree in 1918. She taught school in Newchester through the influenza pandemic that was going on at that time, and then lost her fiance and other members of his family to that outbreak in February of 1920. Nine months later, their daughter Arlene was born on October 20th, and she is still living in California, almost 100 years old. Goldie was raising Arlene at the family farm and working as a dressmaker when she met my grandfather after his return from the war. Now a little bit about the Bauer family. Um, Thomas and Rebecca Pfizer Bauer, shown in the left photo, taken around the mid-1920s, were longtime residents of New Oxford. They had eight children, two of whom died in infancy. Willis was the oldest, followed by two sisters, Alice and Edna, and then Chester, my grandfather, Mary and Charlie. Thomas Bauer was a school teacher in his younger days and served for several years as secretary to the New Oxford Town Council. He did not serve in the, in the Civil War, but his two brothers, Leander and Franklin did. Franklin had moved to Iowa by 1861 and served in regiments from both Iowa and Illinois. Leander lived his entire life in Adams County, mostly at Newchester, and he served with the 187th Pennsylvania Infantry. Leander and his wife are buried at St. John's United Church of Christ Cemetery in Newchester, which is the center photo, where his parents, Thomas R. Bauer and Margaret Cooper Kennedy, are also buried. Rebecca Julian Pfizer was one of 10 children born to Peter Pfizer and Delia Diana Deal, both of New Oxford. And only five of their children survived childhood. We find this to be true of these large families back then. The Pfizer and Deal families were well known in this part of Adams County. Peter Pfizer worked as a carpenter and in the undertaking and funeral business. He was likely the first Pfizer of this family line to have been in this trade and the Pfizer Funeral Home in New Oxford still operates under that name, though it is not run by the family. And Peter and his wife are buried at the New Oxford Cemetery, shown in the right photo, as are Thomas and Rebecca Bauer. From the early 1880s to the early 1940s, the Bauer family lived in a home on Berlin Avenue in downtown New Oxford. This is a Sanborn Company fire insurance map from 1912 of a portion of New Oxford, and up is the east direction going towards Gettysburg. The top slanted purple arrow points to the Bauer home, and this home is still standing as shown in the photograph at the right. Berlin Avenue eventually was renamed North Berlin and South Berlin, and the dividing line between North and South is State 30, or the Lincoln Highway, which appears on this map with the name Philadelphia. The second arrow on Church Street is the house that Chester and Goldie lived in after they were married and where my mother grew up. This street became North Peters Street. And um, you can see that the families could visit each other easily through their backyards. And in, indeed, my mother had very fond memories of them doing that quite a bit when she was young. So now we'll talk a little bit about the discoveries that I made in, in 2016. 2016 was the year that my father died. My mother had died in 2013. And so we cleared out our family home for selling. And I found several mementos of Chester's World War I service among my mom's things that I hadn't even known that we had. So while all of these things collectively were the catalyst that sent me on my World War I journey, two items I think were the most important. And this panoramic photograph is one of them. It measures three feet long by eight inches wide and was rolled up and in a pretty fragile condition. I looked at it with my sister and I asked, are we supposed to know somebody in this picture? And she didn't know, I didn't know, and we really didn't know which side of the family it was from, but we soon learned, soon learned that it was my mother's father who was in the photo and he is circled in red. From this photograph, which reads in the bottom, hard to see here, it's in white, in white ink, Company G, 315th Infantry, Camp Dix, New Jersey, May 1919. So from this, I was able to relate this unit to the larger World War I military organization and began to piece together Chester's place in that war. These were some photographs that were also among my mom's things. Um, some of the few World War I photographs that, that were saved. 
In the left photo is Chester on the left with his younger brother, Charlie, both in uniform at home in New Oxford on leave in the late spring of 1918. In the middle, Chester has been playing catch with his older brother, Willis. They both have mitts on their hands and Willis is holding the ball. Again, Chester's on leave from Camp Meade at this time. And on the right is a photo postcard, very common and popular back then, of Chester standing far right uh, with arrow pointing to his head uh, of some of his mates at Camp Dix in late May, 1919, after they had returned from the war. These two medals were also among my mom's things. On the left is the front view of the medals and on the right is the back view. Through research, I learned that the circular one with the rainbow ribbon is the World War I Victory Medal issued in 1919 to any member of the US military who had served in the armed forces from April 1917 to April 1920. Individual bars could be affixed to the ribbon indicating specific campaigns served in. There is a bar for the Mizargon Offensive, but there was not one with my grandfather's medal. The darker medal in the shape of a Pennsylvania keystone was issued by the Pennsylvania Railroad, also in 1919, to all of their employees who served with the armed forces during the war. My grandfather was working for the PRR in Philadelphia when he uh, registered for the draft in June 1917. This medal is personalized with his inscribed nameplate C. A. Bauer on the back side. The other most important item was this book, Adams County and the World War. My mother kept this book on the bookshelves in our living room. It was written in 1921 by Paul Folk and Percy Eichelberger, two local Adams County men who might have been cousins, not sure about that, who, and who also were in service during the war. Paul Folk served in the Navy and was stationed at Hog Island Shipyard in Philadelphia at the Armistice. He then graduated from the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Gettysburg and had a long career as a minister. Percy Eichelberger served in the headquarters company of the Army's 4th Division and saw active duty in most of the major battles in France. He ended up in education living in New Jersey. This book provides an account of activities of Ad in Adams County that supported the war effort. It has a chapter on the 53 Gold Star Soldiers of Adams County those who died in service during the war years, which became the basis of, for my first article that was published by the Historical Society. The largest part of the book, however, is a listing by hometown of all of the men and women who served during the war. And there are over 1000 names in the book. It was from this book that I learned that the Bowers of New Oxford were a gold star family, having lost my great uncle Charlie Bower to the influenza pandemic while he was in service in October, 1918. And from the book, I also learned that there's a memorial plaque shown in the photograph affixed to the Adams County Courthouse honoring the Gold Star Soldiers of Adams County. And Charlie's name is on that plaque. Paul Folk would go on to become married to Chester and Charlie's sister, Mary Bauer, who was in between them in age in 1923. And my mother was close to her Aunt Mary, especially after Chester died and after she moved to California, they stayed in touch. And so it made perfect sense to me that she had this book in her possession. There are very few pictures of Mary. These are the, the only two I could find of this time. Uh, and these were taken at the time her brothers were preparing for service to go into the war service. Uh, they're taken at the Bauer home on Berlin Avenue in New Oxford. So now we'll get into the Bauer Brothers uh, timelines. And with all of the materials I had that I found, I opened an Ancestry.com account and began researching to, to figure out how to create these timelines. I focused mostly on Chester as he was the only one of the three to serve in France, but I also developed an outline of Willis and Charlie's lives as well, since they were also intertwined. I used a variety of sources, US Census, birth, death, marriage certificates, find a grave photos, history books, websites, and my own trips to Adams County and Philadelphia. But one of the primary sources was the New Oxford Item, a local newspaper that was in publication from 1889 to 1967 that my mother subscribed to for a long time after she moved to California. This was the Facebook of its day. 
And you will see clippings in the rest of the presentation that illustrate how much information you can glean from this source. This clipping is from April 8, 1915, and notes that Willis and Chester had come home from Philadelphia to spend Easter with their parents in New Oxford. Chester had left school after the eighth grade and moved to Philadelphia to live with his older brother, Willis. He was there at the 1910 census when he was 16 years old and Willis was 26. Both were working for the Pennsylvania Railroad, Willis as a clerk and Chester as a messenger, and he later became a clerk. At that census, they were lodgers together at a boarding house, and eventually they moved to separate quarters later that year after Willis got married for the first time. Creating the military service timelines required that I refresh my knowledge of World War I and what was going on in the world the United States and locally in Pennsylvania during this time. The map shows the US Army participation in major offensives and battles at the Western Front. I'll see if I can use my cursor to show you. This is the Mizargun area here where Chester's unit was fighting. In addition to the geography and timing of the war, I needed to understand how the US Army was created and operated for this war. And the document on the right was extremely useful to me in learning about the Army's structure. It's volume nine of many volumes uh, that describe in detail how the Army was created. And this was really useful to me to figure out how Chester and Charlie fit within that structure. So here's a lot of words on the page, but it's important that you sort of understand how the Army was, was uh, was operated in because I'll be talking about the 315th Infantry quite a bit. The structure of this new National Army was one that was created by Major John, General John Pershing, specifically for World War I, and it consisted of 93 divisions. So each division could have up to like 25,000 troops, although they were typically smaller than that. Here I'm using the, 90, the 79th Division as my example, since that's where Chester was assigned. It was made up of men from Eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Washington, DC. Each division consisted of two brigades and each brigade included two infantries. Within each infantry, there were three battalions and within each battalion, there were four companies. So from Chester's military records, I was able to determine that he was in the 79th division, 158th brigade, 315th infantry, second battalion, company G. The 315th Infant Infantry became known as Philadelphia's own because it was made up of soldiers who entered the army through Philadelphia and the surrounding area. The 316th Infantry was originally made up of central Pennsylvania men, then added to by men from New York, Ohio, Connecticut, and also Philadelphia. Many of the soldiers who entered the army through Adams County and Gettysburg went into the 316th Infantry. You will notice this when you read the short biographies of the soldiers in the Folk and Eichelberger book. The map on the right is of Camp Meade in 1918. The 79th Division trained there, and it's located halfway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. in Maryland. It was named for Union Army General George G. Meade, and it was built from the ground up by the soldiers training there who started arriving in September 1917. The camp was originally intended to be temporary, but it became a permanent installation by the Army as Fort Meade in 1928 and is in use today as the Army's PSYOPs Center. They used to have a really great World War I museum there that I went to um, right as they were dismantling it. So I don't know whatever happened to all that stuff, but that museum is no longer there. So my goal in 2016 became to plot the movement of Chester's unit on the ground in northeastern France. And these are just some examples of the resources that I found helpful doing that. From the upper left, you sort of need to start with the big picture of where the armies were. And this book came out in 1938 under the auspices of the American Battle Monuments Commission. And it was the first official travel guide, if you will, that enabled visitors to follow driving routes showing the major battle locations. Then you move down to the division level, and the division, most divisions have their own summary of operations. It's a slender volume with sort of a synopsis of overall operations of that division, but it has really wonderful large uh, wall size maps in it where you can, can plot uh, movements of troops on it. The green cover book is a print by order document that you can find on ABE books. 
And this is the one that gives the much greater detail of the day-by-day -day op movements um, and personnel of the 79th Division. And then if you're lucky, your particular infantry that you're interested in will have its own official history, which I was happy to find that the 315th Infantry had. And this book is about 400 pages and it's downloadable for free from the internet. Uh, the great thing about this particular book is that each company has its own chapter, which makes it really helpful to follow day by day where individual troops are going. And since Chester entered the service through Philadelphia, I found the book at the lower right to be really useful in understanding what was going on at the city at that time. So these are kind of hard to see in a PowerPoint slide, but um, they are the examples of the maps from the 79th Division Summary of Operations. This division took part in two of the three phases of the Mazargan Offensive, the first and the third and last phase, which are what these two maps cover. And these are, like I said, large 24 by 36 or larger fold-out maps that show topography, division boundaries, how the division advanced and during the given phase and a whole lot of other really good information. And so using these and other map resources, I was able to trace Chester's unit on the ground during his time in France. So from a combination of military records and new Oxford item clippings, the timeline and story of each of the brothers wartime years came into focus. This is Chester's World War I draft registration card from June 5th, 1917. The date, this date was established by President Wilson as National Registration Day and was for men aged 21 to 30. The majority of World I draft cards that you find have this date. Chester was inducted into the Army on September 21st, 1917 and sent to Cap Mead. There were several news items of his visits home from November of that year through June of 1918, just before he was sent to France. But I decided to include here clippings of after he arrived in France when the New Oxford item began notifying the town of soldier arrivals. And I won't read these, but you can just see that they're, they're very personal. And so-and-so got a letter from their son saying he's enjoying good health over there. This is a World War I military service record for Chester. Every soldier who served has one of these. And as you can see, it's another really important source of information about a soldier who served in World War I. Chester's total time at the front from September 8th to the armistice on November 11th was about 64 days, a little over two months. He stayed in France until the following May, 1919, and then returned to Philadelphia and was discharged on June 7th. His total time in military service was a little over 20 months. I won't go into the detailed uh, information about his actual movements in France, because uh, you can find that in the journal article. So Charlie Bauer, his younger brother's military story, is quite different from his older, older brother. Charlie was born in April, 1898. So at the time of the draft in June, 1917, he was just 19 years old, too young to enlist by the draft standards. Nonetheless, he persisted, as you can see in the top New Oxford item clip from March 1918. He enlisted through Maryland at a place called Tacoma Park, which is near Washington, D.C., as an assistant embalmer. He was able to use the time he had spent working as a, a teenager for his cousin, New Oxford undertaker William Pfizer, as evidence of his medical background, and apparently the Army decided to let him in, even though he was still underage at this time but because he enlisted, there's no draft card for him. Turley entered service as a private with the medical supply depot at Camp Merritt, New Jersey, and then was then transferred to Camp Mills on Long Island in July, 1918, as shown in the news item. He was promoted to Sergeant while he was there in September, 1918. The map at the right shows the two camps in relation to the World War I embarkation facilities at Hoboken, which is where Chester's ship departed from. Yeah, we have one question. Uh, someone's asking uh, where you can find World War One service records. And I think uh, we both probably have experience with this. I, I have an ancestor who served in the Great War and uh, his service records, like many others, were destroyed in, a, in the fire in St. Louis at the National Archives facility. Uh, do you ha have any more uh, that you could say about that, Valerie? Well, you can find the two that I've shown here, draft cards and, and, uh, and service records through Ancestry.com. That's where I found these. And you're right, there was a fire. And the only record I was able to find from the, the archives in St. Louis was his last pay card, 
um, mm -hmm. they were able to find those. Um, so no, if you're looking for records, there was a fire and they're difficult to find. So thanks. Yeah. Next. Okay. So the statewide World War I training camps became well-known epicenters for the influenza pandemic of 100 years ago. And I use the word epicenter because we use it here and we all know what the epicenter means, especially those of us who live in New York City. And the, the influenza pandemic hit its peak in the fall of 1918, particularly in October. Like many others, Charlie succumbed to the flu and his death came on October 20th, 1918 at age just 20 and a half. The clipping on top notes that his parents received a telegram of his illness and his obituary isn't right. Of note in the obituary is the role his older brother Willis played at this time. And it reads in part, the news of his, Charlie's death was phoned to his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas E. Bauer of Berlin Avenue by his brother, Willis P. Bauer, who was at his bedside when the end came. So clearly Willis, uh, went quickly from Philadelphia over to Long Island to be at his brother's bedside when he passed. Charlie's remains were brought home and he was buried at the New Oxford Cemetery. And like his brother, the details of Charlie's World War I time are also recorded on his military service record, which is this slide. So now we turn to the oldest brother, Willis. Willis had left New Oxford for Philadelphia in 1902 when he was 19 years old. He worked first at a large grocery store, then gained employment with the Pennsylvania Railroad by the 1910 census. As mentioned previously, Chester had joined him in Philadelphia and also worked for the PRR. Willis was 34 years old at the time of the June 1917 draft. So he was too old to register or enlist. So we have one brother that was too young, one that was too old, and one that was just right. He did find ways, however, to offer to be of service. In the New Oxford item clipping from August 8th, 1918, we see that he took and passed the examination to serve overseas with the YMCA, which was a really important service at that time for the military serving in France. And he then registered for a national draft that occurred on September 4th, 1918, which was for men ages 18 to 45. He was not called to serve in either capacity, but he remained working at the PRR through the war years and supporting the Bauer family in New Oxford. So what happened when Chester, to Chester and Willis after the war ended? I focus here mostly on Chester um, because his life is, is, is quite interesting. I was really keen to understand his movements after he returned from the war and how he ended up back in New Oxford, particularly since he'd been gassed at the very end of the war, like so many soldiers were. And piecing together his life was really only made possible by finding these clippings in the New Oxford item. I was so lucky to find these because every day there would be something. And, and you can just, by the time, the dates of these articles, you can begin to piece together someone's movements. The June 5th, 1919 article describes him returning to Camp Dix along with his good friend, Chauncey Colstock, and another local boy. The July 12th article shows that he was to return to his job at the PRR in Philadelphia. However, less than a month later, as the August 7th article shows, Chester was so affected by having been gassed at the end of the war that he left the PRR position and returned home to New Oxford. The article indicates he was likely going to work at the local shoe factory, but instead subsequent articles show that he went to work at the Harris Brothers Men's Store where he stayed off and on for a few years, and then he went to the shoe factory in 1922. I was also interested to know if Chester was active in World War I veterans related activities in New Oxford after the war. And these New Oxford item articles gave me the answer. Yes, indeed he was. And these are just a few examples. He served as pallbearer and other roles in 1920 for soldiers who had been buried originally in France and then were repatriated back to their hometowns. He did this for George Snyder on May 20th, 1920, which is the article on the left. Snyder was the first soldier from New Oxford to die in the war. And the American Legion post there was named for him. And Chester also did this for Dennis Robinson in the middle, middle article on November 8th of that year. Chester also then served as an officer at the Snyder American Legion post, which is shown in the article at right 
in January 1922. So Goldie and Chester, shown in the photograph, met in 1922, and they were married in 1924. Their marriage license identifies his occupation as a shoemaker in New Oxford, and she is a dressmaker. The upper right photo is the Livingston Shoe Factory building on Golden Lane in New Oxford. The shoe factory was a really consistent source of employment in the area for decades, and many members of the Bauer family worked there over the years. This building has been occupied by an antique gallery for quite some time, and it's just down the street from where both Bauer families lived, so it was an easy walk to get to work. The house in the bottom photo is the one that Goldie and Chester lived in in the 1920s and 1930s on North Peter Street, and this is where my mother grew up. These photographs were taken in 2016. Chester supported his family and it went through his employment at the shoe factory. Then as the elected New Oxford Borough tax collector starting in 1927, and then as secretary to the New Oxford School Board in 1928. These roles could have been very much been overlapping. So he appears to have had steady work through the peak of the depression years. In February 1935, he was appointed US Postmaster for New Oxford for a four-year term. This is a position for which you take a rigorous test and are nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. The photo of him here might be the one used for his postmaster appointment, and it's the last one of him we have um, as he aged from my mother's things. The document at the right is a page from the US Postmaster Appointments record book for New Oxford. And highlighted in yellow, you will see Chester's two appointments and then Goldie's two appointments after him. All the time I was growing up, I only knew about Goldie's work as the postmaster and knew that she was the first woman appointed to that position in New Oxford. But it was such a pleasant surprise to see that, that her husband, my grandfather, had held that position before her. We found both of Chester's uh, appointment uh, certificates among my mom's things. And this is the first of the two dated February 1935. I had hoped I might have an original FDR signature, and these were original signatures up until 1927. And after that, they were printed into the, the certificate. But the James A. Farley Postmaster General signature is real. And those of you familiar with New York City know that the main post office in Midtown Manhattan is called the Farley Post Office. Just six months into his second term at the end of December, 1939, Chester died at Hanover Hospital, age 45. The cause of death was acute nephritis. It was thought by his family that being gassed in the war contributed to his health decline in the 20 years that he lived after he got home. Goldie received an original typed and signed condolence letter from Postmaster General Farley. The second paragraph reads, it may afford you some comfort to know that in over five years of service as postmaster, Mr. Bauer had a good record and the department feels in his passing, it has lost a capable official. Chester was buried at the New Oxford Cemetery, his World War I military service clearly inscribed on his grave marker. The oldest of the brothers, Willis, was to outlive both of his younger brothers. This is his draft registration form from 1942 for World War II. This draft was commonly called the old man's draft for men aged 45 to 64. The government needed to get an inventory of manpower resources after it entered the war. And it really wasn't intended that these men would be called into active service, but they just wanted to figure out if their labor skills might be used in the war effort. And Willis was not called for service during that war. He was married to Audie Noel Kelly, who was from Gettysburg in February 1924. And he worked as an accountant for various companies, first in Lancaster, then in York, which is where they were living when he died in 1947 at age 64. And he and Audie are also buried at the New Oxford Cemetery. After Chester's death, Goldie was appointed acting postmaster. She then passed the rigorous test and was officially appointed by FDR in August of 1940 and then held that position for nearly 25 years. She was responsible for several improvements in postal service during her tenure, including the creation of street addresses. Before this, you merely put the name of the addressee and New Oxford PA or PENA on the envelope. This is what my mother did for years and it knew where, where to go, how to get to where it was going. 
Another improvement of which she was quite proud was the installation of an outdoor mail chute in front of the post office. This is an article from the Gettysburg Times and it's scanned from an original article. That's the reason why it is the quality it is. And I'm gonna read a small passage just because I think it goes to, to Goldie's character. The curb service mailbox stands on a concrete post at the southwest corner of the square in New Oxford, directly in front of the post office and was planned and erected by the postmistress, Mrs. Goldie M. Bauer, who paid the entire cost, $17, except for the paint. The latter was furnished by the government. Thank you very much. It was the first curb mail ser uh, service mailbox in this part of Pennsylvania. And the photo at the right shows the post office building today uh, in use as a family dentistry. Well, this was taken four years ago, so. Uh, Goldie moved to Hanover after she retired and she died there in 1985. And she is also buried in New Oxford Cemetery next to her husband. So that's the past. I wanted to share with you now uh, about my travels to France. It became apparent to me that I really needed to go to the Musargan area to actually walk on the ground where my grandfather had served. And you know, I could be an armchair traveler, but my family and friends know that, no, that's kind of not me. So with the time I have left, I'll share a little bit of the three journeys that I took. I was very lucky to find my now good friend and battlefield guide, Randy Golke from New Jersey through internet searching in the early summer of 2016. I shared my grandfather's timeline with him and he helped me find a guide for getting uh, my first trip in early November that year in France. I was to return two more times in 2017 and 2018. And it now holds a very special place in my travel history. And Randy had said, Valerie, you will either be one and done or you'll come back over and over again. So we know what happened. In this photograph, we are at the top of the Montfaucon World War I Memorial Tower. And this is the main monument that commemorates the American victory in the Musargon campaign. The tower is about 200 feet tall and the observation platform is reached by 234 steps in a circular staircase. I've done it twice. And it provides a 360 degree view of this primary area of the battle. And the great thing about it is you can see on the parapet wall at, at the lower left side that um, it's interpreted. And so you know exactly what you're looking at and, and where things were going on in the battlefield at that time. So my first trip was in November of 2016 and I wanted to accomplish a few things with this trip. First, I wanted to go at a time of year when Chester was there in the fall, cold, rainy, muddy. And I got that, which was great. Second, because of the limited tide I, I had with my guide, Marcus Clower, shown in this photo, we just had four days. I really wanted to just get the lay of the land and see the main Muzargan areas where the 79th Division troops were stationed. By this time, I had also done research on the Company G soldiers, Chester's mates, who had died and were buried in France and wanted to photograph their graves. So the grave on the right is one of these soldiers, Americo di Pasquale. He was an Italian immigrant from, from Philadelphia who died on the very last day of the war, as you can see on this monument. He was killed by machine gun fire while running with messages between two units. My guide for this trip was Marcus Clower, who has a long time interest as Randy does in the Musargon, particularly from the French and German perspective. And it's really good to get that perspective because they were at it long before we ever arrived on French soil. He's German by birth, but has lived in Northern France for some time. And he retired there years ago from, three years ago, from over 30 years in the German army. He's fluent in German, French, and English, and gave me what became known as my four-day life-changing first Musargon itinerary. There's all sorts of map resources for touring in this area. This happens to be one focused on the Great War that I found very useful. This is published by France's equivalent of the National Geographic Society here, and they publish a lot of really good maps. If, if you know how to read French, you can order it directly from their website. Another objective of this trip was to arrive in France by a transatlantic crossing, like my grandfather had. So there's no troop ships, and I did the next best thing, hop on the Queen Mary II and do a, an eastbound journey from Brooklyn to Southampton. And the top right photo is one of the many I took of the North Atlantic Sea over those seven days. The image on the bottom right is in the Argonne Forest from a hike that Marcus took me on. And it's of a German monument that he knew about that was erected 
by the unit that was camped there for four years. It's still standing and evidence of the war 100 years later is all around you in this part of France, if you know how to find it. My second France trip was at the end of May, 2017, and was timed to attend the Memorial Day services at two American military cemeteries in the Meuse Argonne. This is my guide friend, Randy, who has also had a long time interest in this area and has been friends with Marcus for over 30 years. In 2017, he quit his real job as a financial advisor to move to the Mizargan for six months and offer individual and small group tours of the battlefields there. On this trip, I had seven full days with Randy and he too put together an outstanding itinerary for us. And by this time I had started my research and writing about the Adams County Gold Star soldiers. So one of my objectives was to photograph grave markers of the soldiers who had remained buried in the Mazargan cemeteries and were not repatriated back to New Oxford or the Adams County area. And on the right is one of these soldiers, Joseph A. Williams of Gettysburg. And those of you who have this copy of the journal, you'll recognize this photograph was used on the, the front of the journal in which the Gold Star story, story is published. Another of Randy's specialties is then and now site visits and photography. He made the intense effort of going to the National Archives and scanning all of the photographs that were taken in 1919 by the Army where US soldiers had served. And it's a lot of photographs and they are a really tremendous resource. He then finds the ones relevant to your ancestor and locates them on a map and then takes you to see them so that you can take the now photo. This is an example of a location important for the 79th Division and my grandfather's unit, the 315th Infantry. It's known as Madeline Farm and was held by the German Army since nearly the beginning of the war. They used it primarily as a hospital facility and there's an existing uh, German Army cemetery now at the location where I'm standing to take the photograph on the right. The 79th Division commanders thought it was still a medical unit when the first phase of the Mizar gun offensive started and it was one of the objectives to clear this, this facility during that first phase by my grandfathers and other units. They never reached it during that phase because it had become a strong point for the German army with overwhelming machine gun fire and other artillery, not just at the buildings, but in the surrounding woods as well. You can imagine it was the cause of substantial casualties on the US side. And we're gonna come back to this location in a, in a later slide. My third France trip was uh, in se late September of 2018 and was time to participate in the seven day small group tour that was organized by Randy and Marcus around commemoration events for the 100 year anniversary of the start of the Ms. Argonne Offensive. So here we are at the Montfaucon Tower from which the panoramic photo in the earlier slide was taken. It was really enjoyable to meet others with a Ms. Argonne interest in the small group and each person had some special requests that these guys tried to fulfill for us. One of my requests was to do some final photographs of Adam, Adams County Gold Star Soldiers grave markers for the story that was soon to be published. And I had a really interesting experience doing this. There were five graves I had to visit. Two were at Sammy Hill and three were at the Romagna Cemetery. We did Sammy Hill first where the photograph at the right is taken. And imagine my surprise when I saw that someone had been there before me and left a small bouquet of white roses at both of the graves there and a photograph at this one. The same thing happened when we got to Romagna, all three graves there had white rose bouquets at them. My tour mates went, Belle, what is going on? I said, I don't know. But I figured it had to be somebody who was familiar with Adams County soldiers. Cause as you can see, there's no other roses at any of the other graves at either cemetery. So when I got home, I got in touch with Tim Smith at the, the uh, Historical Society, and he let me know that yes, indeed, a member of the society named Al Ferranto had been in France and had visited the same graves that I did. What a, what a terrific coincidence. And this is the grave of Charles Cassatt of Gettysburg and this uh, that, Mr., that Mr. Ferranto put there, and it's from the Folk and Eichelberger book. So now we're back to, to Madeline Farm. And my second special request to Randy and Marcus was to try and actually walk the route that the 315th and other units took when they were trying to reach Madeline Farm, shown in the then and now set of photographs earlier. This is one of my many 
personal maps, using a base map and then marking it for my own purposes. And it plots the true movements over those three days that uh, we're trying to advance to Madeline Farm. And Madeline Farm is circled in red at the top of the map. Randy was able to obtain access for us on this private farm road between the little community of Nantiwa and the Boadizogon, which is the green blob just south of Madeline Farm on the map. The photograph on the right was taken at the location of the small asterisk on the map that's circled in orange. And Suicide Hill, which you can see to the southwest, um, would be just over my left shoulder uh, from this photograph. As you can probably imagine, this was one of the more emotional hikes that I did, knowing that my grandfather could have been at that same spot 100 years before. And it was called Suicide Hill for a reason. The troops were pinned down there and, and killed en masse by the machine guns that were up at Madeline Farm. The landscape is still giving up evidence of the Great War in this part of France. These are some of the types of features and ammunition that you can still see. When artillery shells are found, they are typically tagged with orange spray paint and located via GPS so others can come along and remove them. I kept the shell casing and bullet that is in Randy's hand at the lower right, mostly because they were American made and he found them near Madeline Farm where my grandfather's unit had fought. Small items like this are, yeah, sort of okay to remove, but lar larger items really should be left behind. The two structures on the left are German bunkers, one above ground and one below ground, still existing in the landscape after 100 years. But unlike Gettysburg, most of the battlefields of the Meuse-Argonne are not curated or interpreted or even delineated on the ground. Some of the more famous locations do have interpretive features such as at Verdun, and the Lost Battalion site, and some, some trench examples, and also the, the little village détruit. These are the small villages in the area that were completely destroyed by the war and not rebuilt. The American military cemeteries and monuments are also open to the public and have interpretive features with them. But you really do need to have a seasoned guide, especially if you want to follow in the footsteps of an ancestor and trace their movements over land that is now forested or farmed or in the small villages. And I will always be very grateful to Randy and Marcus for their excellent guiding for me. So not having known where this journey would take me when I started in 2016, I started writing and ended up with several essays that I thought might be of interest to Adams County Historical Society. Mind you, I did all of this research without contacting them or taking advantage of their resources through their website. And in March 2018, I sent a package off to them with copies of three articles, the Chester article, the Gold Star article, and one other article, and a self-introduction, not having a clue as to how these essays might be received. But an enthusiastic response came from both Tim and Andrew, and then we were off to the races. The Gold Star Soldiers article was published first on the left to coincide with commemorating the 100 year anniversary of the end of the war, and then came my grandfather's story in the next issue. So we're at the end and big thank you is due to uh, Andrew and Tim for just helping bring this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation to all of you. And I do appreciate everybody participating and uh, lots of other people helped with this and um, would just like to say thanks again to, to everybody who helped. Thank and you now, so this, much. The sun, the sun has gone down, so I'm a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Valerie. I, I think uh, all of us have really enjoyed uh, hearing uh, what one person's journey was like to discover uh, the history of, of, of what their ancestor endured during such a, a, an incredible period of history. And I'm just blown away by battlefields in Europe that still have uh, such an incredible collection of relics just laying on the fields. Um, you know, it reminds you what it, what it must have been like maybe 50 or 60 years ago uh, in Gettysburg, you know, there, there still would have been quite a few more relics on the fields, uh, easier to find than, than they, they might be today. Um, but I really en enjoyed the program. I, I'm sure everyone else did. We had some great comments and feedback. Um, if you're more interested in, in uh, or want to learn more about what you heard tonight, as Valerie said, there are two uh, Adams County Historical Society journals. Both are available on our website under the gift shop or bookstore tab. 
um, and you can get those via Amazon and they'll ship and send right, right out to your house. Uh, so you can, you can get reading and uh, <laughs> learn more about uh, this story and uh, the more uh, the, the broader story of, of the, the many Adams County veterans um, of the First World War, including uh, quite a few who lost their lives uh, in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Uh, so uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight, and we will be back with you next Thursday. Uh, this is the Adams County Historical Society's Thursday night uh, program series, and uh, we're, we're uh, happy to continue doing this for everybody and hope everyone is well and, and, and healthy. Um, and, and thanks again for spending your time with us here tonight.